Hey everyone, so I trust this video finds you doing well and blessed even in this difficult market. Um, this is a Q&A, you know, I got a lot of different content I love to put out. I've got new nodes, staking opportunities, all sorts of just interesting stuff. But given the way the market's going, I think it's maybe more appropriate to hold off just for a little bit on those and uh, just talk more about mindsets, life, crypto, the markets, just a kind of a overall mindset battle plan, so to speak. And in that, uh, I wanted to do a Q&A. I've been wanting to do a Q&A forever and I just, like not driving, but an actual Q&A where it's submitted questions. And uh, there's always something coming up that drags me away from it. But anyway, we're gonna do that today. I think this is gonna be a lot of fun. I've got some questions. Uh, I had put out a Google form a few weeks back, several weeks back actually. Got a lot of really great questions. I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but we will get to some of them. Let's just check out real quick before we get into this. I haven't looked at this in a while. Success, what people think it looks like and what it really looks like. Now, you know, going through this market, you're experiencing what it really looks like. You know, I've made this post, I don't know how many times. Short-term price action does not equal long-term success in a project. I said that when certain projects were up and I said that when certain projects were down, okay? Um, I said that when the market's bullish, I said that when the market's bearish, right? We go through cycles, we go through human psychology, we go through outside variables and factors in the um, um, economy and different things like that. There's always going to be something that causes the market to go sideways, down, really down, really up, and all this other kind of stuff. But this is life in general. This isn't even just the markets. I mean, if you look at the left, this is, you know, when we get into anything, it's a business, it's a new um eating regimen, it's a new, um, you know, relationship, it's a new investment, it's a new course we're taking, it's a, all this type of stuff. This is what we imagine. We imagine it's just going to be a straight line up to success. I'm pointing the wrong side of the camera, <laughs> but it's a straight line up to success. You're not going to hit any roadblocks. It's going to go perfectly. You know, let's just say, for example, in business, you're going to start that business, you're going to come out with your first product or service. It's going to go great. You're going to make a million dollars. You're not going to have any problems, right? This is what we picture. And then life hits, right? The reality sets in. Yeah, it goes up. Oh my gosh, this is going great. Oh no, it's going down. Oh, this is great. It's going back up. Oh no, it's going back down. And we go through these emotional cycles. You know, one thing I really like about a blockchain backer is he talks about keeping an emotional diary. I don't do that, but I actually think that's a great idea because... Oftentimes I've heard him, uh, most of you know who he is, but oftentimes I've heard him refer back to it. And it's really interesting because it's understanding the emotions. You know, if we were able to be 100% logical and 0% emotional, these downtrends wouldn't even bother us because we know where it's leading. But in the moment, it's easier said than done, isn't it? So this is life in general. I don't care what it is. I always say this. I'm a big believer in visualization right? I don't want to put my energy and focus towards outcomes I don't want, but I understand and expect that they could happen. So I visualize the left, but expect the right. Unmet expectations in relationships, in anything will cause you to have this, this response of, oh, I can't believe this is happening. And you let your emotions take, take over and take control because of unmet expectations. So I would say, Expect the right, but plan, focus, visualize on the left. And you'll win as long as the overall trend is heading upwards, no matter if you're down further from where you started. As long as the overall trend is upwards, you're winning, no matter what. So I hope that little bit of uh, motivation helps. It helps just to see things from a different angle, right? Remember where we are. Remember where we are. And remember what's important, especially in these times when markets are going down and you're hearing about everything going on with Luna and there's people doing, they're making rash decisions. So I'll just leave it at that. And, uh, you know, just remember what's important in life. Money comes, money goes, but you only have one life to live. There's people who love you and that you love. And it's important to take inventory about what's important, what we take for granted. Okay. Uh, I got a bunch of questions here. Before we get into questions real quick, just talk about the market, right? Because 
you know, I made a tweet about um, that I was looking to buy this weekend, right? That, you know, I think personally and, you know, again, I'll show you here. Um, again, you know, I, I don't need to be right in this that I'm looking to buy this weekend. I think we probably bought them this weekend. Who knows, right? I don't need to be right. I don't need to be right 100%. I just need to be right close to 100%, okay? And, and quite frankly, even if we were to go further down from here, which we could, um, these are still great entry points. I see nothing wrong with coming in and beginning a lot of your buying this weekend. Not financial advice, but that's what I'm doing, okay? I've got some family that wants to get into crypto. They have a substantial amount of money. And I've been holding onto their cash and since Bitcoin was at like 35K. To, to me, the way I, this is kind of the way I look at this. May tends to be historically a bad month. In crypto and in markets in general, remember last year when crypto crashed? Okay, of course now TradingView wants me to, to pay here. But when crypto crashed last year, everybody thinks, and I'm going to kind of, you know, a little bit of my conspiracy side will come out here. Okay. So bear with me. Everybody thinks it's because, oh, it's, uh, you know, Elon Musk came out and announced that he wasn't going to accept uh, Bitcoin anymore. He was bashing his energy use. Yes, but I don't think that's really the reason. I think the market was way too hot. Okay. In general, I mean, look at it. If you just look at the trend going up and up and up, the market was way too hot in general, number one. And number two, he, Elon Musk, was promoting Bitcoin and Doge and all this tough stuff so much that how would it look if it crashed? under his watch, so to speak, in that it was outside of his control, right? Um, wouldn't look good. So in my opinion, he knew it was going to crash and he crashed it. That's just my take, okay? We were having flash crashes mm, late March and then another one in mid-April. And then we really started coming down May 8th. And now, isn't that interesting, again, with May, about 50% between that time? More if you were to count at the top right here. Um, in my opinion, it was going to crash one way or another. He just caused it to happen so it looks like he was maintaining control. That's just my opinion. Okay, I think a lot of these people are assets. That's just my take on it. You know, Agree or disagree, that's perfectly fine. But the point I'm trying to make is May is historically a bad month. There's a reason why. The saying of sell in May and go away exists because between May and October, historically, the months perform worse than the rest of the year. Now, there's years, of course, I get it, that that's not true. But I'm saying on an average, historically, it is it tends to be true. And of course, because Bitcoin is correlated to, to equities and cryptos obviously follows Bitcoin, it kind of goes to show that um, May tends to be a bad month for crypto. Okay. And it's really interesting. So we talked about you know, May 8th, and it, 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 we were really getting our big drop right around the same time. I mean, we were heading down here for a little bit. Again, flash crashes in April, just like we had last year. And then our big dive right around May 8th again. So again, yeah, I understand interest rates are going up. I, they're not going up that much. I, okay, they're going up, of course, not that much in my opinion. There's no reason that the dollar is going to continue going up. It might in the short term, of course. Medium to long term, no, dollar's not going to keep going up. So we could certainly, because, you know, last year we were going down until, let's see, right around July 21st is when we started moving back up. Okay, so could we go down until July 21st? Of course. Could we go down until um, August or September? Of course. We could go all the way down to $20,000. It's really funny. Every time we go up, we make the new moves up. You know, like for example, in this time frame, in this time frame, everyone's calling for a hundred thousand. Oh, we're gonna a hundred thousand dollars, and here's the date, and here's my Fibonacci's, my trend lines, and I'm gonna show you on the chart why. When we're going down here, oh, Bitcoin's going to to, to twenty thousand, fifteen thousand, ten thousand. I see people calling for five thousand. It's just so interesting. If you were to take a picture in time, a snapshot in time during the sentiment of a down market and an up market, you will find that I think people's emotions take over a little bit more than the logic. And I'm that way too. I'm not perfect. I'm just saying it, it's just something uh, I'm an observer of people and it's just something I notice. Up market, 
crazy high price predictions and here's when it's going to happen and here's the charts to show it you know down market crazy low price predictions here's the charts to show it and here's when it's going to happen so just remember that just remember that it, it's it, it, that's why i think that emotional log is actually brilliant it really is brilliant anyway just because it's happened historically doesn't mean it has to happen again but that's my opinion and that's what i'm going with. And of course, you can always go and look into lunar eclipses and things of that nature. I'm not getting into astrology. Uh, I'm not even saying I agree or don't agree with astrology. I'm not talking about it, but it is very interesting if you go and do a little short study on um, the astrological cycles and markets going down and up. It does seem to have quite a pattern, quite a trend going there. So even if we go lower, I'm happy. I think these are great entry points. We probably will go lower, frankly, sitting on 29 and a half. We'll probably go lower. And uh, that's fine. I'll just buy more. If you know what you hold, then you know what? Um, these are great entry points. No one's ever going to time the bottom. No one's ever going to time the top. All I say is it's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market. So hope that helps. That's what I'm doing. And uh, maybe I'll do a short video at some point on what I'm accumulating. Some of it is passive income related. Uh, much of it's not. All right. So let's get into the first question that I have here from Chuck Finley on Twitter. Um, he asked two questions. He says, the first question is, how has your walk with Christ impacted your journey in crypto? Great question. And the second question is, how do you see Phoenix's price action playing out between now and Q4? Now, of course, granted, this was submitted, I don't know, I, I want to say maybe six weeks or so ago. So kind of bear that in mind. A lot has happened since then. So I'll just answer these two questions. Um, the first one, which is a, a phenomenal question. And, you know, there's people who are tuning in that don't believe in God, don't believe in Jesus and all that. And that's, you know, your decision. Um, I'm not here to argue with you. I'll just here, here to answer the question as it's presented and to share my thoughts, my beliefs, and, you know, we'll go from there. So how has your walk with Christ impacted your journey in crypto? So in anything in life, business, health, relationships, and crypto, of course, and really just the struggles, the successes and everything in life. I try to look at everything through the lenses of God and his will and what he wants me to do, not really what I want to do, right? I've got things that I want to do. What I want is for them to be aligned with what he wants me to do. That's the key thing, right? That I want to walk in the path that he has, not in the path that I think is right. Um, there's been things in my life that I thought were the right decision or the right direction. And, um, just based on how they turned out, um, they, those were more my decisions than God's perfect will, right? He allowed it, but it wasn't really what he desired, right? Um, I think we've all had those instances, but I really try to be cognizant of, um, the voice of God and the direction of God. And that's that comes with having a relationship with him, right? So that you're guided by him and he acts as your compass. <laughs> yeah, your compass, your map, your GPS, and all of that. Doesn't mean that on the GPS, you're always going to make the right turns on the right streets at the right time all the time. But the goal is when you get off course to come back on course. So I take that with crypto. And, you know, crypto is a very greed centered um space right any time where there's money to be made and any time where people are minted millionaires and deca millionaires sometimes very quickly and there's no regulation so it's kind of a free-for-all um it brings a lot of bad actors in and unfortunately we only hear about the bad actors if you do something good in your life very few people will come and tell you but if you do something bad in your life everybody will come and tell you so the point i'm trying to make is we tend to focus a lot on the bad actors and for good reasons but we generally don't focus on the good actors in the space. So um, when you look at that, it is a very greed centered space in that there's money to be made and oftentimes very quick money to be made. And that can really take over. I've seen people, I'm not going to mention names, but I've seen people in the space who, you know, I thought they were one person and as money entered the conversation, and I'm not talking about a little bit of money. I'm talking about a lot of money. Um, those people have, have, kind of went off the straight and narrow, so to speak. Um, not that I'm saying I knew they were believers. I don't. I'm just saying 
even people who are not believers in God and Jesus um, can still have a certain direction in life. And then you notice money really takes them in a bad direction, a very bad direction. So I've seen that happen plenty of times before. The key thing I think is for me, I've always looked at money differently, right? I'm a contrarian. I think differently. When everybody's thinking about going left, I say there's got to be a problem with going left because everybody's thinking it. So when people are all taking a certain opinion, I like to think, mm, is there something wrong with that opinion? Not that it's always wrong, but sometimes it can be. And I think there's been a lot of misinterpretations of wealth, right? There's been a lot of misinterpretations of money and uh, making money and being rich and all this type of stuff because we heard certain scriptures quoted you know, time and time again, um, you know, it, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, um, you know, uh, the money is the root of all evil. We've heard that over and over again. Of course, it's the love of money is the root of all kinds of different evils is really what it is. And I've seen that play out a hundred percent. Like I just mentioned that the key thing here is that, um, you know, what is your God? right? Is, is God sovereign in that he's in control of everything? And is he above everything? And is Christ who you worship or do you worship money, right? There's nothing wrong with striving and working hard and focusing on business. Um, as long as you understand that all that comes under the authority of Christ. If you don't understand that, then what you will do is you will take that and put it above his authority and you will worship it. And then you put God to the side only when you need him in the tragic event. Right. And, um, you know, we look at scripture, a lot of people in scripture were very wealthy. You know, you take Abraham, the, f the father of the of faith in, in many instances, he had gold and silver and, you know, cattle. And he wasn't just wealthy. He was very wealthy. Okay. That was their measure of wealth in, in those days. Did he make mistakes? Of course. David, King David, when David was with King, very rich. Did he make mistakes? Absolutely. We can name them. Um, but he was still a man after God's own heart. You know, King Solomon, probably one of the wisest men in scripture, you know, aside from God, of course, Jesus, um, was so rich that I think I looked this up one time and, and I believe I read that they tried to measure um, uh, Solomon's riches based on today's wealth. And I believe if I'm not mistaken that I read that he would be considered a trillionaire based on today's measure of money. These were all people with a lot of money and none of them were perfect, right? But money didn't cause them to be distant from God right now. Of course we go, go through instances where we are distant from God, but we come back because ultimately if we're striving to work hard in business, we have to remember who God is. And we have to remember um, to submit underneath him and his word, right? And not do things our way, but do things his way. You know, there's a great, great, great speech. Love it. By uh, Denzel Washington. A lot of you guys may have heard it on YouTube. It says, put God first. That's such a great speech. If you go listen to it. Um, it's just a really, really moving speech. And I agree. It's putting God first above everything else. So, it's a different mindset, I would say, is to answer that question. And I'll just, before we move on, I'll just mention one last thing. Um, you know, everybody's looking for their blessing. They're wondering, where's my blessing? Where's my blessing? I want things. I want money. I want cars. I want house homes. And those things in of themselves are not wrong. You know, the parable of the talents was about taking what you have and multiplying it, right? Is to be good stewards of what you have. That's not wrong. Wanting to multiply things that you have are not wrong. Um, what's wrong is when you are blessed and the blessing stops with you rather than be you being the conduit to bless somebody else. When you get something, it's your responsibility to bless somebody else is to do God's work, right? So people do God's work with time. People do God's work with their resources. Sometimes those resources are money. We just don't want to put our faith in money. We want to understand that money is a tool not to be worshipped. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, 1 Timothy 6.17 that says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So money is in its right, rightful place. It is the person behind it. It is a tool. 
just like anything else is a tool, it's up to the person who is using it, how they're using it, and what their intentions are behind it that makes it good or bad. As far as Phoenix price action, I mean, look, the whole market is getting uh, beaten up. The whole market. I mean, I submit to you that you will not find a passive income project that has been around for 60 days or more that isn't down darn near 70, 80% by now. Okay, so, uh, you know, let's wait and see what happens. There's been delays on some of the projects. Um, hence that there's not a whole lot to market at the moment. <laughs> um, anyway, so my point is the new contract needs to get deployed. That will cause a happening, not even a happening, more than that. It will dramatically lower the emissions. It will really help a lot with the selling pressure because there is still buying pressure, but the 22.5% daily emissions are still applying. So that really does kind of throw a monkey wrench into the whole thing until the new tokenomics take effect. I think we'll see some positive price action and hopefully these incubators can get launched soon and start spending enough profit. Okay, so Chuck Finley, thank you for the great questions and I hope that helps. All right, the second question that I have is from, I want to say gentleman, but I don't know if it's a gentleman. The Twitter handle is Made Figures. <laughs> cool name. The question is, what was your initial introduction to the world of crypto? Um, it's interesting. So I, I'll back up, kind of give you a really short history, not even history, just a short summary of like my journey, just in general. Um, so I, uh, of course, when I was going through college, I wanted to get work experience in IT. I got my uh, AS and BA in uh, information systems. And I thought, you know, it'd be great if I can get some kind of experience, but I didn't, even then I didn't really want to work for someone else. It's so fascinating. I, I kind of look back at my mindset and I can see why it brought me to where I am now. So I had my own computer repair business that did actually really well. I'm in a smaller town. But I pretty much dominated most of the town just because of the type of service I provided. And frankly, it, more than the work that I provided, it was the way that I treated people in my bedside manner. And um, if you're just little things, I mean, I would do little things, you know, that, 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 you know, in business, I was told by a mentor that there's changes, little changes you can do that whisper and changes that scream. Right. And I take that to a lot of things. There's that 80, 20 again, I did little things that nobody else would do bedside manner wise. And I think that in addition to my ability to help fix the problem, people felt like I cared about them. There's an old saying that people don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. Right. And I think that was the one reason that did so well. Um, I went and worked at local government for almost five years as a uh, systems analyst. Even during that time, I didn't want to work for someone else. I realized that, look, there's a window to this. There is a ceiling. You know, a dentist, for example, I don't care how talented or skilled you are as a doctor, as a surgeon, as whatever, your ability to make wealth, if your only ability to make wealth is you showing up and physically working, um, there's a ceiling to that. You know, a dentist can't say, hey, you know, I think I'm going to drill two mouths at the same time to try to leverage my work. Right. I, you probably say, hey, I think I'll go somewhere else. So as far as working physically, there is a ceiling. OK, and I understand in this market that people want to um, keep their job because crypto is uncertain. But keep in mind, money comes and goes time. You can never get back. OK, and I mean, look, we have one life. And this is my take on it. OK, you don't have to agree with it. That's fine. Uh, the way I view it is that. You have one life. Do you want to be on your deathbed looking back on your life and saying, I shoulda, I woulda, I coulda? No, you, I mean, you had your chance. So the way I look at it is I like to take risks. I like to go big. That's just my take on it. Because if I don't go big, I don't want to regret it later. Okay. So um, anyway, I, I had started an e-commerce business when I was working at the same time. And let me tell you, that was difficult attending conferences and learning and courses and building up a physical products business and doing all this kind of stuff on Amazon while working in IT. And I was the only in-house IT, by the way, for probably well over a hundred users, 80 machines, you know, workstations, 
you know, what, 12 or 15 physical servers, 30 virtual servers, you know, 30, 40 VLANs, four offsite locations. I mean, it was a big job. It was, it was not, not, it wasn't something that didn't take a lot of time. It took a tremendous amount of time. So building a business on top of that, very difficult. And that's why it took years to get out of that job. So as I was in um, the e-commerce business, I got into uh, precious metals, physical silver. I'm a big believer in physical silver still. I think everybody should own physical metals, specifically silver, because this is the most undervalued and the most utilized metal Okay, in products, services, things like that. And it's going to be so uh, difficult in the future to get it, in my opinion, that uh, yes, I know it's severely manipulated paper trades and all that, but I'm just saying. Um, great hedge to have. And I learned about, I won't even mention who the guy was because I, I think he's a total scam artist, but an individual that helps supposedly, uh, with trading, give you signals. The guy was, couldn't be even me more inaccurate, but nonetheless, um, I thought this is a great idea. I could trade crypto back and forth and use the profits to buy more physical silver. I don't have to use my own money. That was the original concept behind it. Then I started learning about all this stuff and what the hell, what is Digi buy it? And there was this thing called XRP. What the heck is that? And I reeled about it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, I guess, it might only one that sees this. So of course, you know, like a lot of people, the one thing I will say about the kind of the <laughs> out there XRP community, not everybody in XRP community is out there, but many are, um, is that it was a great introduction into crypto for a lot of people. It's kind of the gateway drug into cryptocurrency. So once I got into crypto, I realized this is way more than just a, a, a quick trade thing. Okay, this is something, this is something way, way more than that. And so anyway, it, it came to my attention that this is much bigger than what I thought it was. And obviously just started accumulating, accumulating, learned about they're in early, gosh, early 2021. It's like January, February, started learning a lot about the passive income side of things and nodes and stake. And I think, man, this is, if you build this up the right way, this can be bigger than, like I built e-commerce businesses just the, the time, the energy, the money, the stress that is um, inherently involved with building that to make it successful is enormous. Just to make a million dollar business, which by the way, in physical products, and even a million dollars in revenue ain't that much when you are really, you know, you're turning inventory and things like this. There's not a ton of um, profit left over, even in that kind of scenario, right? So I look at this passive income stuff. I'm like, my gosh, this is, you know, 10%, if even that, of the effort. Maybe not 10% of the stress because of the charts, but 10% of the effort. This is a real like opportunity here. So I started learning more about that. And uh, I was posting things on Twitter, just my thoughts. I mean, it was never any intention to run a channel, to have an account, to be a quote unquote influencer, which I hate that word. I, I see myself as an um, educator. There are people who are influencers that corral you in directions. I don't consider myself that. But I, I never had any intention of that. It just kind of really happened organically through your guys' demand, quite frankly. So the other question is, what would you consider to be your most prized passive source of income, either on or off chain? Well, I'll be honest right now, I am 100% focused on passive income and cryptocurrency. So on chain, because that's where the opportunity is. You just line up with the upcoming opportunity. Like you guys don't know this, you know. I got into Amazon in 2014. If I'd have gotten into it just a couple years earlier, I, I would have become wealthy just by default, just because of the wave and the trend, right? We haven't even gotten anywhere near that trend in crypto yet. We're still early. So when I see that, I'm like, really, like, there's no, see, I'm like a, I'm an all in sort of person. When I see what's coming and I see the handwriting on the wall, I just position myself. So the way I look at it is cryptocurrency is the future. Irregard regardless, I should say, of what happens with the markets, I don't really care what the price action does because I know it's the future. It makes no difference to me. So um, I'm focused on cryptocurrency, passive income, and of course, nodes and um, DeFi is a service, which I don't even like the word, but DeFi as a service is evolving. I know about some things that are coming down the pipeline that it's going to make a guy's jaw drop, frankly. But, you know, when I see the innovation happening, I'm like, okay, there's something way more we haven't even discovered yet. And when we do, it's going to be game changing. So that's um, my answer to that. And I'm solely cryptocurrency for passive income at the moment. But uh, great question. Thanks for asking that. Okay, next question.
Next question. Uh, Wispo.eth. Thank you, Wispo.eth. The question, two questions. The first one is, how excited are you for the future of crypto, or are you at all? And the second question is, how do you manage your time to do research on projects? So I'll, I'll answer the first question. Well, I am i can't even really explain how excited I am about crypto because there's no words to define it. You know, it's like um, we have um, we have really one word, um, you know, to say love, right? Um, love is love, but... You know, there were many different ways to say love in um, Greek and in other languages. Eros, agape, philia, all meant different things. And when I say love, I'm not, I, I, the point I'm trying to make is, is it's like your spouse, right? You say you love your spouse. You say you love this food you're eating or whatever. It's one word. There's really no shades of gray in that. And I'm not saying I love crypto in the sense that I'm putting it, you know, up as an idol, but I'm just saying I love the space. I love the technology behind it. I think blockchain is the future of everything. I'll be honest with you. That's I'm kind of a blockchain maximalist. I just, whether it's by innovation or by force because of the mark of the beast or whatever it may be, blockchain is the future of everything. It is what it is. That leads into a whole other question I won't get into, but the future of crypto I'm very excited about. Um, there's a lot of scams, of course, guys. In any market, there's going to be scammers. You know, I was, um, we're looking, my wife and I are looking to buy a new house um, because, you know, we are pregnant, as I had mentioned on Twitter. Very excited about that. But our home's a little small uh, for three people and we have two dogs. Uh, I have to show you guys my dogs sometimes. Sometimes you guys will really get a kick out of them. One of my dogs is an Anatolian Shepherd. Big dog. Big dog. She, she weighs like 120 pounds. She needs to get her weight down. But big dog. So we're running out of space, right? We're going to look at a home this morning and really nice house. And we're talking to the realtor and she's saying, yeah, you know, there's some realtors out there that um, uh, when they're working with a seller, they like manipulate the market in that they get a family member of the seller to come in and put fake bids on the house to get the price up, to get a legitimate buyer to bid way over asking price. And I just thought, wow, that's that's." I never even thought about that, but yeah, I can see how that would happen. We see people like Bernie Madoff and all sorts of scam artists. Like, guys, it happens in any market. It's not unique to cryptocurrency. It's not unique to anything. So it does happen, right? I get it. I get it. Believe me. I'm not downplaying when people get hurt. You know, um, I've bought things that have gotten rugged just because I was risking, you know, high risk money, right? It does happen. It's like if you haven't been rugged, you, uh, you uh, don't have your initiation in the crypto, so to speak, right? So um, there's bad actors, but there's good actors. There's good intentions in crypto. I want to focus on the good. There's bad. Of course, there's bad. There's a lot of good, guys. It's 80-20. I think the vast majority of people in crypto want to win and want to see others win. But there's, unfortunately, when that, when that small 20% or whatever it may be come in and hurt people, it's it can be devastating. So it's, it's unfortunate, but I'm very excited for crypto. I'm very excited for what's coming for things that I know are coming that I, you know, not really ready to announce yet. Just things I know about. It's just uh, really fascinating stuff that, I mean, you guys are going to love it. I, I'm going to love it. So how do you manage your time to do research on projects? Uh, I don't do a very good job at it. I'll just be straight with you. I always like to be transparent about with you guys. You guys say such nice things about me and I, I really appreciate it, but I'm, I'm not far from perfect. I have a lot of work to do on myself. And uh, managing my time to do research on projects could be significantly better. I got a spreadsheet of projects that, for one reason or another, I just haven't gotten to them. Things in life have come up. And uh, yeah, I could do a better job. But what I'm trying to do is dedicate days, you know, a, a whole day or a block of time in each day to just research, right? And I need to do a video on research. It's not a one, two, three sort of process. Sometimes I just look at a project and I'm turned off by it right away just for various reasons. But when a project does not turn me off and I know there's more to it, I have to dig deeper. And that's, that's what really takes more time. 99% of the projects out there are garbage. I'm just going to be honest. I'm 99% of the stuff that I get pitched are as nonsense. But uh, to answer your question, it, I need to do a better job at it. And my intention, um, once I get my schedule kind of fixed here shortly, 
should be to dedicate whole days. Like for example, a Saturday is a research day or a Monday is a research day or every day between you know four and five before I end the day is a research time. And uh, I have a list of questions and things like that and I grade projects. I'll show you guys how I do it at some point. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, I'll, I'll hopefully kind of get my, my own ducks in a row and uh, be more efficient with that. And I'll show you guys what I do and how I do it. Good question though. Thanks for the question. Appreciate it. All right. Next question. Great question, actually, from June. Nam June on Twitter. He says, as always, thank you for your info and content. Thank you. I appreciate the kind words. Can you briefly explain how you are doing your taxes in regards to nodes and this? Uh, yes. So I will tell you how I am doing it. This is not tax advice. This is not legal advice. This is not financial advice. This is no advice. This is what I'm doing. Okay. D do your own research and do it at your own risk. So there seems to be a little bit of a debate. Now I'm in the United States, so your tax laws may vary depending on where you are, but I'm in the United States and there's a little bit of a debate as to whether gas fees, maintenance fees, claim fees, the building of nodes and nests, especially when you have to give your token up in return for the node, whether those are deductible. There is a debate. Now, uh, I am of the opinion that they are because the way I look at it, and again, that doesn't mean that they will be, okay? The IRS can come and make new laws in a few years. Like, don't take what I'm saying and do it and say, hey, you cost me all this money. I'm just telling you how I'm viewing it. Please do your, do your own due diligence and talk to a tax professional. I'm just telling you what I view. So the way I view it is I look at a node or nest or whatever, okay, sort of like a Uber or a Lyft driver would look at a car, right? If they're going to do uh, run a full-time business driving people around, then the car is their purchase. That's a legitimate business purchase. So if I, as an investor, am buying, I'm giving you 10 tokens, like say Strongblock, for example, I'm giving you 10 tokens in exchange for a node. If my business is a financial investing business, then tell me how that's not a business deduction, right? Now, I've spoken to CPAs that disagree. They think that, well, the IRS is going to view it as a hobby, and they're not gonna view it as a business, but that's why I've set up a business. I set up a business to show that I'm not just participating in a hobby, I'm actually running a legitimate business, okay? I've got everything documented, hence the reason I've used Patrick um, Canuso, my lat, my, oh, a couple of videos ago. Um, you know, he keeps track of everything, right? Um, I have a separate CPA, the only reason I have a separate CPA is because it was a CPA that I used in e-commerce, big firm, I'll just tell you who they are. They're ProVision out of uh, Phoenix, Arizona, but they're very, very, very expensive to get into. Once you're in, you're good. But initially, I mean, they could charge five figures just for you to initiate with them. So because I'm already in with them, I wanted to keep using them. Um, I have a CPA who's a super smart guy. And um, he has agreed to file my taxes that way. He, you know, we kind of went back and forth on a little bit, but that's how he sees it. And I think it's legitimate. So I set up an actual business. Now, if you don't have a legal structure, I think you could get into trouble. They could say, hey, well, you don't even have a business behind this. So you want to remove and defeat as many of those arguments as possible. So, you know, um, um, when you have a car as an Uber or a Lyft driver, so you, you, you know, you have a car that is a legitimate business purchase, but then you got the mileage and or gas. Right, so I see transaction costs, maintenance fees, claim fees is sort of the same thing. Okay, um, now if you said, hey, you know, you stake your tokens, like in the case of StoreX, SRX, or PreSearch, where you don't give up your tokens but you stake them, different. You know, that's a different conversation. I'd have a, I'd have a harder time arguing that that is an actual purchase. Now I think that the renting the VPS and all that is a purchase, I'm sure, you know, for sure. Um, and that's a deduction, but I, I can't view if I'm staking my tokens and I can always get them back. I can't legitimately in my mind say that that's a purchase because I didn't give up anything in exchange for the node. So again, that's my view on it. You do what you need to do and come to your own conclusion. And please talk to a tax professional because that's not me, but I hope that helps, you know, to some degree. This is a good one. The crypto cat on Twitter says, uh, do you actually need to get a new or clean laptop in order to get started with nodes or will a VPN suffice? Um, it's a good question. But you're using the word clean. So I, I presume here you're, you're 
asking the question because you're concerned about malware and security and security related issues. If we're talking about crypto in general, you need to have a, a, a safe environment, right? You need to have, I mean, my opinion is you need to have a secure network, you need to have a secure machine you're using, whether that's Linux or a Windows, Mac, it doesn't matter, but you need to be a clean machine. Um, if you're if you're asking in terms of you want to run the nodes on your machine, um, it, it really doesn't matter because personally I never run the actual nodes on my machine. If it's if it's Gala or a pre-search or SRX or something where you need to run it on your own server, um, I always do a VPS for that anyway, just because I'm trying to leverage my time. I don't want to leave my laptop on 24 hours a day and not be able to travel and all that. But you're asking about a VPN, so I presume you're referring to here to the security aspect. I mean, look, this is crypto. You shouldn't do anything unless you have a clean machine. Um, you got to remember, too, I, I still intend on doing this security series. It's one of those things I just, I don't know when I'll get to it, but I think you guys are going to have some eye openers in that. Having worked hands-on with malware, VPN doesn't protect you as much as you think it does. Um, if you're infected with malware, I don't care what kind of VPN you have. You're still infected with malware. All it does is tunnel your traffic somewhere else, right? That's all it does. So some VPN services provide additional security functions that can help mitigate that. But I can tell you from working hands-on with malware, and I haven't done it in a couple of years, so it's, it's likely far more advanced now. I keep up to date on it a little bit, but not as much. Um, a VPN just, it, it makes it so that somebody can't sit in between your laptop and your router, you know, or device if you're on a hotspot, public hotspot, and sniff or see your traffic in the middle. That's really all it does. It also stops your internet provider from being able to view your internet traffic and that kind of stuff. Um, doesn't really stop you from getting infected. It can in some instances. That really depends on what you're being targeted with. But my point is, is um, you know, just keep in mind that a VPN is, is a heavily marketed product. And I don't think a ton of people truly understand. Not to be condescending, I'm just saying. I think a lot of the marketing behind VPNs prey on people's fear, right? That they get a VPN and all of a sudden they're going to be protected. And it's just not the case. So anyway, to answer your question, yes, you need to make sure you have a clean machine. If you're working with crypto in general, always get a cold hardware storage wallet, like a Trezor or a Ledger. And yeah, a VPN is not a bad idea. You can start, still certainly use a VPN, especially if you're traveling. Once you're traveling, that's when it becomes really a lot more important to be using some sort of VPN or a mobile hotspot. And CryptoCat had left a very nice comment. He says, you seem to be a man of God, and I respect that. I hope your breakdowns stay true and you are not or become a shiller. Your content has been fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, anytime you talk about a project, people think you're shilling. Anytime you ask questions, they think you're funny. It's such an interesting space, right? If you get excited and talk about something, you're shilling it. I mean, why can't you just legitimately be excited about something, at, at, you know, a project at that time? Why is that like a crime and you have to be a shiller? I, I don't really get it. Um, anyway, but no, I, I never have the intention of being a shill. I have intention of being an educator. Just like I have nothing to sell you guys. I don't have a Discord. I don't have a Patreon. I don't have a special Telegram group where you can get my calls. I don't have any of that stuff. I have one thing and one thing to sell you, and that's on yourself. And I hope I make that sale 100% of the time. It's what I'm trying to sell you on. So I'm trying to sell you on projects that I see, the way I view them, and just educate them on what they are or educate you on what those projects are. And, you know, you have to make that decision yourself. Um, I love Rich Dad, Poor Dad's radio show because he always talks about, you know, we're edu we educate you about money and ultimately it's your decision. That's a, that's really the, the take that I, that I have. I educate people in the space and... Uh, let them make their own decisions. But thank you for the kind words. I appreciate you. Okay, next question. I'm going to show something different on the screen if you're getting sick of looking at the q and <laughs> I've got something here to show you in a second. Vito Lopez, Vitop70. He asks, how would you best allocate a budget between $500 and $1,000? Which protocols and why? Well, um, I've given this answer to people privately. You're not going to like my answer. Um, you know, I'm not going to really be apologetic about it because it's, I think the right answer, you know, people want to hear the truth until you give them the truth. But bottom line is I would save up more money before you invest. Now I know when you submitted this question, the market was probably much different, but at, especially at this point, there's some great buys on the market right now. Um, but 
I would, first of all, even if you had $20,000, I would never tell you what to put your money in. I would never tell you where to allocate it, when to do it, how long to do it for. I would basically say, look, here's a catalog of projects that I'm looking at that I like, and I will educate you through tweets and video content, and you have to make your own decision, right? I'm not even saying that the projects that I'm talking about will be successful in the long run. I hope they are. And I certainly only try to put things out there. Because remember, the things that I put out there, I put my own money in. That's my rule. You can ask anybody who has pitched a project to me. I always tell them, number one, I don't accept your money. That's the first thing. Number two, I have to be buying into it before I even talk about it. And the reason is because if I'm going to talk about it, I got to put my money where my mouth is, right? I'm not going to come out and talk about something I don't even own. That's just my take on it. Okay. So I would never tell you where to put your money, but just answering it in a vacuum, I would tell you, you need more money, man. I don't think you can really get a whole lot of places with $500 to $1,000. I mean, you can go and put it in freeway in USD and just earn the 40%. I mean, you could certainly do that. Um, that's a, probably about as safe as you can get in crypto. That is, you know, this is the thing, you know, this would be a really terrible answer, but I'm going to give it anyway. If I was in your position and I only had five hundred to a thousand dollars, I'd go find a second and third job. I mean, that's just what I would do personally. I would do whatever it takes to make sure I have enough ammunition to come into this market because this is not like a quick flip market. I see blockchain technology is so much more than that. So, hence the story that I gave earlier about coming in and doing a quick trade and changing my mindset because I saw what this was. So for me, five hundred to a thousand dollars just it's not enough. I would say five to 10 X that, and then you have a start and that's just a start. So in my opinion, if I was really low on cash, I'd be going out and finding the second job. And I know that that's a sucky answer, not the crappy answer to give, but here's something I want to show you. So I found this earlier on uh, something that I was looking at and I love this because um, this is applicable to anything. And I knew a question I didn't, without knowing the question, I knew a question would come up where this was applicable to show you have a, direct relationship with what's easy now and what that results later. So easy now, and by the way, like I'm not picking on you, Vito. I'm just using this as an example for everybody, not you. I'm just in general, this applies to almost anything really in life if you think about it. So what's easy now is to, you know, could be to um, um, procrastinate. It could be to not get things done. It could be to barely put forth any effort. It could be to not educate yourself. It could be to not do the work that you deep down in your heart know is necessary. That's easy right now, of course. Okay. And you will like that to a degree now, but as time goes on, you're going to hate it later. You're going to suffer later because of it. Whereas flip that on its head. You know what I would have done with this chart? If I had made this, I would have made easy now. And I would have made this line get thicker and thicker and thicker as you get down to make it look like it's getting harder over time, because that's actually true too. But flip that on its head. What's hard now, doing the work now, educating yourself, you know, surrounding yourself with the right people, spending the time to learn, spending the time to read. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but maybe working another job to get more money to invest. Um, it could be watching what you eat right now, all that stuff, right? The work now results in the easy, I want to say easy, but the, the prospering later. So it's taking this concept and flipping it on his head. If we have this mindset hard now, it's kind of like, um, work now, play later mentality, as opposed to play now, work later. Um, the concept is look. You got one life. By the time I finish this statement that I'm making right now, the time that it took me to state this statement is gone and I'll never get it back. And that's the way I look at things. I look at the fact that money comes and goes. Time does not come back. You have one life. You have one 24-hour block in every day. Do you want to look back a year, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years from now and say, Gosh, I should have used my time better. I should have been learning. I should have taken advantage of this opportunity. My family would be in such a better position. I'd be in a better position. I'd be healthier, mentally healthier, spiritually, you know, maybe healthier, things like that. 
I always, when I'm looking at a decision, I say to myself, if it's a difficult decision, I don't always know what to do. I always ask, which will I regret more? Will I regret not doing it? And that's how I usually make my decisions. And the bottom line is you got to put the work in now to have something later. Remember, the people that you're idolizing, I hate to use that word, but the people you're following, they got to that point, not by taking the easy now approach, they got to that point by taking the hard now approach. So if you want to be like them, do the things that they did. That's the work now, prosper later. Don't take the easy road now and you suffer later for it. So long answer to a phenomenal question and I hope that helps you know make a decision. Okay, actually, let's leave this up. This is a great reminder, so I'm just going to leave this up. We're almost an hour into this. I'm only halfway through the question, so we're not going to get to all of them. I'm just going to pick, you know, maybe a couple more here at most. Uh, there's a question about a project that I'm not going to answer, so we're going to skip that one. Uh, it's a project that's already launched. Uh, I'm not going to comment on it. Uh, here's a question. Would you be willing to put together a crypto buying lesson for dummies? I'm new to the idea, but realize the opportunity that exists here, but it's like learning a foreign language. Um, I can kind of commiserate. Like I come from the world of IT and even when I first came to crypto, I'm like trying to wrap my head around some of the concepts and it took me a little bit, but I did. Um, when I talk to my family, it they literally tell me the same thing. It's like learning a foreign language, right? So I think if you come from a technical background, this is a lot easier to pick up. Although, you know, it's interesting because in e-commerce, I had people tell me, oh, well, you were able to make that work because you're a tech person. And I said, no, like I know 70-year-old grandmas doing this that had nothing to do with computers. So, you know, there's people that just tend to pick things up easier. Um, look, I've said before, I don't have a Patreon or any of this kind of stuff. I mean, it doesn't mean I won't someday. It's just, it's not something that I am planning on or that's not something I'm even thinking about right now. Um, doesn't mean I wouldn't. Would I put together a crypto buying lesson for dummies? Um, I could do that. I think the audience here is pretty smart in, in that they kind of understand what I'm talking about. But, you know, probably something really simple and basic wouldn't be a bad idea. Something that you guys could take and just hand off to your family and say, hey, watch this. Watch this so you can figure it out. Um, I've, <laughs> I've helped people on the phone before try to buy certain things and it's... Uh, it can be difficult. Kind of reminded me of tech support. That's why I never did tech support over the phone because I need to see things. It's very hard for me to just walk people through it. But I, I do think that something like that would be beneficial. So I'll make a note here to do that. I'm not going to charge you guys for it. It's going to be free. Like all my content's free. Um, make a note here. Crypto buying lesson for dummies. I'm not going to call you guys dummies. But <laughs> the concept is basic. Um, yeah. So to answer the question, yep, I will put something together. And uh, let you guys know. Good question. Okay, so uh, this person's asking, Tommy is asking, what's my opinion of Atlas Cloud and Comb Financial? I don't know much about Comb Financial. Obviously, I think this was submitted before the whole mess happened with Atlas. It was unfortunate that what happened, it looked like there was just inner turmoil between the founders. People wanted to walk away. It was money being misused and all this other kind of stuff. So it was a big mess. And um, by the way, big thumbs up and thanks to uh, Loki from Thor. He stepped in and uh, assisted them with that. Um, I was not able to participate. He had asked if I would help and I just, something was going on. I don't even remember what it was. I, I just, I wasn't even really on my phone or computer or anything that day. Um, just something personally was going on, but uh, I appreciate him thinking of me. Um, it, yeah, big thumbs up for him for helping the community to disperse the treasury back to the investors. So thanks, Loki, for doing that. The other question is, uh, how do you allocate portfolio weight? That's a tough one because this channel is called Passive Aggressive Income. It's not just a fun name, but I started thinking about the philosophy behind it. The philosophy behind passive income is interesting because people have an idea. So let me go back here. I'm going to show you our favorite image again of what success looks like. So people have this idea of what passive income is. It's on the left side here. You see this? You're going to buy Strong or Phoenix or SRX or Gala or Presearch or any number of um, nodes or staking or whatever. And what's going to happen is it's just going to go up straight, and up straight up in the line. This is the price of the token. This is your profits and this is your bank account going straight up in a line. This is the concept here. You invest in one or two or three or four projects and you could walk away and retire and it'll work for you. 
And there's some truth to that, okay? However, however, the reason it's passive aggressive income is because in my opinion, okay, there, there's just like when people buy and hold something and they buy it, they hold it and they sell it for a profit and they either buy the same token or stock or whatever again, or they diversify and find something else. You need to take that same mindset with the passive income space because there are projects that haven't quite they haven't quite figured out their tokenomics to the degree where the project can last years. Okay. Some have and some haven't. And when I say some have, I mean, we got to wait years for it to play out, frankly, for it to really have that thesis proven true. My point is you should always be looking for new opportunities because if you're waiting on one or two projects to do this here, this is what it's really going to do on the right. It's going to go up. Hey, oh, this is fantastic. This is great. This is the you know, best thing ever. And then the price goes down or there's some technical thing and you know, maybe you lose your nodes. Or I don't know, something, right? Mainnet didn't get launched like in the case of Presearch or games aren't getting launched in the case of Gala. And, um, you know, Gala came out and said, oh, we're going to work with the SEC and that caused a loss of confidence or, you know, Stromblock's not launching something fast enough with their chain or Phoenix isn't coming out with their incubators fast enough or whatever it may be. You can pick it, just fill in the blank and it goes down. But people get confidence again because they do something that goes up and down and up. And this is really what passive income is like in reality. So what you need to be doing is looking for new opportunities. Invest in one project, let the profits come, take those profits, find another passive income project and keep repeating that. Now, sometimes you lose. And that's why I say 80-20. If you invest in 10 projects, you can't help but find two that are home runs. You just can't. That's just the way this, that, that's the, it's almost like a law of nature. Okay. And um, the, so my, my entire goal is always when I'm looking at a passive income project, I'm like, this is great. I can take my foot off the gas a little bit, but not take it off completely because I need to be taking these profits and redeploying them into something else. Now, in my instance, personally, right now, I'm sitting on a lot of cash only because you know, I'm looking to buy a house. So in that instance, there's a lot of cash that I'm not deploying and that's intentional. But my point is, be aggressive with your passive income. Don't just sit back on your laurels because you bought strong at 300, it's at 900. No, take that cash and be aggressive. Go find something else, you know? Um, anyway, so yeah, it, in terms of portfolio way, I'm just, I'm taking my profits and I'm saying I'm willing to risk X number of dollars. That's different for everybody. And maybe your goal is you don't really care about the passive income, but you want the passive income to buy your blue chips, Maybe your Ethereum, your AVAX, your XRP, your XLM, your XDC, your Bitcoin, your whatever. And maybe you use your passive income to buy that. That'd be a great idea too. Okay. And then you can sell those when the price appreciates. And, um, you know, it's sort of like passive income, only that you have the weight to get the price appreciation. So um, anyway, I've got a lot of buy and holds. I'm looking to get into buy and holds right now because as far as a passive income space is concerned, it's a little bit on the downtrend in terms of the innovation, the great projects coming out. So I'm just kind of waiting and um, it's not really appropriate given the market condition to talk about. So uh, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I hope that helps. All right. Um, guy, <laughs> Ping Guy on Twitter says, what's your best recommendation for the best crypto software out there? Um, I'll be honest with you. Before I found Patrick, I was looking into Coinly and Taxbit and this software and that software. And first of all, they're all different. Some of them are, are easy to use. Some of them are an absolute pain in the rear end to use. And what I was finding is that most of them were inaccurate. I mean, some of them were extremely inaccurate, like by half. I'm like, how do you get this off by the amount of uh, tokens that I have? So I said, look, I'm wasting a tremendous amount of time I'm always looking to leverage my time because I'm always thinking in a business mindset. So I'm always looking to leverage my time. I'm thinking this is a tremendous waste of my time. And the bottom line is um, I want to leverage. I'm willing to pay somebody to just do this the right way. Somebody who this is what they like to do. This is their specialty. This is their business. So I gave up on the whole tax software thing just because it, it was taking too much of my time. And I didn't like using my time that way. So I started interviewing um, accountants and CPAs and I came across Patrick and what impressed me about him was the fact that, um, you know, when I was interviewing people, when I would interview them about crypto, they said, oh yeah, 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 we know all about staking and Bitcoin mining. And that's basically where we'd begin and end. When I started mentioning nodes and 
all this other kind of stuff. It's like their eyes just like glazed over in the conversation. And I had to interview like darn near six, seven people to find Patrick. So I liked him because when I mentioned what I mentioned to him, he already knew what it was and his limitation wasn't on certain blockchains, right? Finding software that can work with like Phantom and some other ones, it, it, it's a real challenge. So just when you learn a new piece of software, now it doesn't cover the blockchain you're on. So I just said, you know what, let me just pay somebody to do this the right way. So I gave up on the whole tax software side and just um, use Patrick to do it the right way. Now, you know, just make sure if you use him, you know, look over his work. Sometimes there's a little thing here and there that's, that's off, but otherwise, man, I mean, what a great way to gain my time back. So I was very happy with that decision. Okay. We have this question and one more, and that's it. Uh, here's a great question. What's your favorite option for earning on USD coin? Looking for something I can get a return on without a lockup period. Well, that's, I mean, the most obvious one is freeway. I mean, that is my go-to. Um, I've done several videos. Let's see if I go back here. I did, let's see. Yeah, this is the first one here three months ago. <clears throat> what is freeway slash Obit? I explain what freeway is, the platform. And then I did one a month ago where I explain the freeway token separate from the platform. Then I did one three weeks ago for Phoenix where I was in Arizona um, on some just general updates around freeway, the new interface, tokenomics and so forth. So for me, no brainer freeway. And for the people who are concerned about, by the way, um, this is up to you in any one of these videos, I have a referral link to go sign up for freeway. If you want to use that, I would greatly appreciate it. You don't have to, but uh, I would really appreciate it if you did. It'll be in the description of these. But a lot of people are concerned about the whole stablecoin thing going on with Terra, UST. And I totally understand that. In my opinion, USD coin is not going to fail. Um, Circle, is they're kind of the founders and careers behind USD coin. Look who invested in Circle, guys. You know, JP Morgan invested in Circle. JP Morgan does not lose. They don't deploy money to lose it. So in my opinion, JP Morgan makes the majority of the rules, you know, and, um, when you make the rules, you make the rules in your favor. So anything can happen, of course, but you know, look, if tether or USD coin were to crash, like USD did, it wouldn't affect just the crypto market. It would affect a lot of markets. It would, it could be potentially a, a global meltdown in a lot of fat ways. So I don't foresee that happening. I think USD coins is pretty safe. Love freeway. And I, of the things Freeway is doing, I just I don't know why anybody would choose another platform, and that, that, hence the reason why I think Freeway Token hundred X's. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but at some point for sure. Um, you know why wouldn't it? So Freeway is my recommendation. Hope that helps. All right, final question. Thank you so much, guys, for submitting. These are great questions, for sure. I really appreciate this, and we'll do this more. I, I just thought this was a lot of fun. The Martinis Band on Twitter. A couple of questions here. Expectations for OHM. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, Todd, it's really hard to say in this market. I mean, OHM was crashing down before the market was really melting down. So the sentiment is bad in the market. The sentiment is worse for the, um, you know, these like rebase tokens, right? So expectations, like, look, I haven't sold. I'm holding. I'm not going to buy at 900 and sell at 15. That doesn't make sense to me. So, um, you know, a lot of these projects are just... If you were to look out on a chart on some of these projects, you're like, man, well, why would you sell when it was that high and that low when it went right back up again? I'm not saying that that's going to happen for OHM, but you know, um, I think Olympus and Hector, uh, you know, Hector, Hector Finance are calling themselves now. They need to start executing on some of the things. They've executed on a lot, but they need to execute more. They need to find a way to get the sentiment back up again in those projects because the sentiment's really bad. So expectations, I don't know really, to be honest with you. I hate to give that answer. I just don't know. We'll wait and see. I think it'll make a comeback, but that's maybe just um, confirmation bias. I don't really know, but I'm not going to sell at $15. I'll, be, I'll tell you that. But I'm also not accumulating anymore either. So we will kind of wait and see with that. The second question is freeway is looking pretty awesome, but you must have some concerns. What would those be? Uh, concerns. Um, I mean, the only concern right off the, the bat would be, uh, well, a couple. The first would be maybe they don't get their broker license for some reason, right? I mean, they're working with FINRA and the expectations that it happens this summer. So we'll see if that comes to fruition. But if it doesn't, that's not going to look good. Or if it gets delayed, I mean, okay, it gets a little delayed, but as long as it's not too delayed. 
The other thing is some of the um, workings behind the scenes of the underwriting and some of the things that happen with how they get the funds, but they don't touch your money. There's a, a gentleman that I know, super smart guy, um, who has some questions about it. And he's got a lot of traditional finance background. And he's actually trying to get legal documents with agreements from Freeway so we could have his attorney look it over. Not because he's sparing FUD. I mean, he's invested, but he just, before he brings in, he, this guy can bring 10, $20 million over. That's how much influence and money this guy has connections to. For him to recommend it, to bring that much money over, he just has some concerns. And I really appreciate his concerns because he, he asks questions that I don't even think of because he comes from the traditional finance world. So uh, I'm curious to see the outcome of that. Um, that's still being worked on, but those would be my only concerns really. And, uh, last part of this question is favorite scripture passage. Uh, great question. That would be Jeremiah nine, 23 through 24. Now I I'll tell you, I go through different favorite passages depending on different times of my life. You know, revelation three twenty was a favorite Proverbs three, five and six was a favorite at one point. Jeremiah nine, 23 through 24 just screams out for a lot of reasons, um, primarily because it shows the dependence on God, right? So I will end with quoting this. Um, you know, Jeremiah, it's actually the verse that I quoted at the end of last year when I was doing that DeFi as a service video. It says, uh, let, this is what the Lord says, let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. I like that because it takes complete dependence off of how great you are and puts it on how great God is. It takes the, it takes the focus off of, look at how wise I am, look at how smart I am, and puts it on God. It takes the focus off of, oh, look how strong I am. I'm a strong person. I'm a man, you know, um, which is not like wrong in of itself. But I'm saying it takes the focus off of that and puts it onto God. It takes the focus off of the riches. Oh, I'm rich. I got money. I'm the richest person. I'm so smart. I'm so strong and I'm so rich and all this kind of stuff and puts it on God. And it says, like he who boasts, boasts that he understands and knows me, right? So... It's putting the focus on God and his sovereignty and his providential ability to guide your life and not you focusing on how great you are, but how great he is. So that's my favorite verse now. Um, it tends to change, like I say, over time. But right now, <clears throat> I love that passage. I oftentimes quote it um, before sleeping at night just to remind myself, you know, regardless of how great the day went, that it went that way because of God's blessings and his uh, providential, really sovereignty in my life and being there in times when um, otherwise I would have never gotten out of it. So thank you for that question. Thank you for the great questions, guys. I really appreciate uh, everything. And we'll go and do this again for sure. And we'll do more Q&A uh, related stuff. I want to talk a lot about mindset, like I say, moving forward and just different, different things I think make more sense in this market. You know, I do have other projects. I'm going to have to get to them eventually. We can only talk about mindset for so long, but I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you have any other questions, again, um, I'll put a form out there, but really follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter because I will, I will be posting something saying, hey, I'm going to be doing another Q&A, you know, post your question below type of thing. And then you can just post it below. Maybe we'll do it that way. And also put a form out there if you want to be anonymous. But these are great questions, and it's just a great time to sit back and see what you, what you know, what questions are you guys asking in your mind, and what are things that are on your heart, and just talk about stuff that you wouldn't be able to normally cover in just like one video. So I hope this helps, guys. You know, again, please keep your mental health a priority, your spiritual spiritual health a priority, um, and you know, if you need to take a step away from social media and cryptocurrency, that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, you, you're you're not wrong for doing that, but you know, I just to say. You're loved and you love people and focus on, you know, God's love for you, your love for people, people's love for you. And let's build bridges instead of burning them down. And let's be kind to each other. When the person you're talking to on Twitter or social media, you know, 
saying something that could push them over the edge, you know, let's, you don't know what that person's going through. So let's just be kind to each other and loving to each other. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay. So God bless. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, we'll talk later. Take care now.